Okay, so let us uh, start our discussion on this set of protocols uh, which provide kind of control functionalities or uh, additional management functionalities along with the uh, IP protocol and the IP layer. Uh, so this set of protocols, uh, so out of that ICMP, uh, ARP, these protocols run as a kind of uh, uh, additional protocol and the service protocol along with the IP layer. And NAT is a specific type of service to support uh, large number of IP networks uh, within, within a kind of subnet. So we'll discuss about the idea of NAT fast network address translator and then we'll go with the protocols uh, ARP, uh, which stands for address resolution protocol, and then ICMP, which stands for internet control messaging. Now, uh, to start with, uh, so in the, we, we have already looked into the uh, IPv4 block of IP addresses. So we have seen that uh, we have mainly three classes of IP addresses, class A, class B, class C. And from these classes of IP addresses, the addresses are assigned to the end host. And class B addresses are specifically reserved for the multicast IP. Whereas class E is reserved for the future needs, particularly for the research purpose or creating small private networks, something like that. Now, among this uh, set of uh, IP addresses which are available with class A, class B, and class C, some set of IP addresses have been de designated as the private IP addresses. Now, what are the pri private IP addresses and why we move towards that dimension? So first of all, uh, a major problem with the IP before is that the number of IP addresses are limited. Well, so if you look into the scale of uh, IP addresses which are available in IP before, so you can assign host addresses from class A, class B, or class C. Now in class A, we know that there are uh, there is eight bit of uh, network address and uh, uh, twenty four bit of uh, host address. Now with that, I can have to the power 24 minus 2, that many number of different IP addresses which are possible. Uh, in case of class B, it is 16-bit network address and 16-bit host address. So we can have to the power 16 minus uh, 2, that many number of uh, hosts which are possible. Similarly, for class C IP addresses, I have 24-bit of uh, network address and 8-bit of host address. So I can have uh, to the power 8 minus 2, that many number of uh, hosts uh, available for every network. Now, if you just try to calculate the number of IP addresses that we have, uh, that is very limited. And out of that, we are also discarding some of the IP addresses for broadcast IP uh, or the subnet IP. And whenever we are going for the CID annotation, again, for different subnets or supernets, we will have one broadcast IP and one network IP, which we are typically not assigning to the host. That way, the total number of IPv4 addresses that we have is significantly less compared to the number of network devices that we have right now. So nowadays, you can imagine that uh, all of us have uh, multiple devices which require an IP address. So for example, in our mobile, we require an IP address. In my laptop, I need an IP address whenever I'm connecting it to the internet. And more importantly, as you are moving towards the era of smart home, IoT, that area, where all the different devices they are connected to the internet, they need an IP address. So for example, in my office, I have two different machines which are connected to the internet and they need IP address for their interface. I have one laptop which is connected. For that, I need an IP address. My printer is a network printer which is connected with the internet. So for the printer, I need an IP address. Similarly, if I go to my home, uh, I have a smart TV. So the smart TV needs an IP address. I have an Amazon Echo. The Amazon Echo needs an IP address. I have a smart AC. That needs an IP address. So that way, this IP addresses, the number of IP addresses that we need, it is not limited to the number of users. Nowadays, a single user might need more than one IP address. So everyone needs some 10 to 12 different IP addresses. And whenever we are moving towards industry automation, where I have multiple different IV sensors which are connected to the internet, they need separate IP addresses. And people are 
having wearable devices like smartwatch. So that way, every independent individual devices which are connected to the internet, for that you need an idea. And you can just imagine that uh, we, in, in today's era, we do not need to think of that, well, every person will have a single IP address. Rather, we need to think of that every device that we see around us, that need an IP address. So that was a kind of massive shift from the idea that that ARPANET was, ARPANET engineers were envisioned once upon a time. So when the ARPANET was first formed, people thought of that, well, the internet will comprise of the user, that every user is going to connect to the internet. So for every human being, I can just think of one idea. This. So that way, they have just thought of that, well, we have approximately 10 million people in the uh, internet, so I need that many number of IP addresses. But whenever we are moving towards IP addresses per device, the number is enormous. Well, and interestingly, people understood this problem in early 1990s. Well, so at that time, IPv6 was introduced. So this IPv6 has a large IP address space, uh, 128 bit IP address space, so it can have many more number of IP addresses with IPv6. But here is an interesting fact or interesting problem about internet. That any new protocol that you are designing, that new protocol needs to have a kind of backward compatibility. Because uh, in internet, say, thinking about an operating system, the operating system works like a standalone software. In your machine, you can just install a patch to update your machine and your machine will start working. But whenever you are thinking of a network protocol stack, in network protocol stack, it is not only about your machine, rather it is the collection of all the devices which are connected to the internet. So if you just design a new protocol and patch your protocol stack, the protocol stack within your machine, that is not going to work. You need to patch almost all the machines in the internet or a kind of large subset of it to make it work. And that was the problem with this IPv6. So people developed IPv6, they envisioned that well, IPv6 um, uh, gradually will replace IPv4, where we will have uh, much more larger scale of IP, IP uh, addresses. And IPv6 actually solves many of the problems which were there uh, with the IPv4. But the problem with IPv6 is that the fundamental address structure or the fundamental package structure in the internet that got changed. Well, now if you change the packet header, if you just send the packet header from my machine, say for example, like this is packet header whose size is different, whose address space is different, and I am sending that to a remote host or to a machine, and that machine doesn't understand IPv6. Well, so your protocol is not going to work. And that is the kind of major challenge in deploying any kind of protocols over the internet that you need compatibility among the devices. It is not like that, that you independently push your protocol in the internet and it will start working. Well, so and, and in overnight, you cannot make changes in all the machines, all the servers to support it. Well, so that way, as such, when IPv6 was designed, again the ARPANET engineer, so this internet, the evaluation of the internet was actually based on the experience of its engineers. So as we design new architecture, as we design new protocols, people thought of that, well, I have a new set of protocols, theoretically it should provide good performance. Now, wherever they are going to implement it in practice, they could have found out different kind of issues and they gradually solve those issues to make the protocol deployable over the internet. Well, uh, so one of the very interesting example that you have already learned about the TCP congestion control algorithm that was proposed by Jacobson. And the major challenge of Jacobson was that to make the TCP congestion control compatible with the existing implementation of the TCP. And that way, the excellent engineering piece of work that Jacobson did design was a congestion control algorithm which is completely tuned by the center. So the, uh, in, in TCP congestion control algorithm, the interesting fact is that the receiver has no role to play in the condition control as such, right? So uh, in most of the condition control algorithm, apart from few of its variants like SAP, all other condition control algorithm, it is completely centered. 
So that way, if I just upgrade the congestion control algorithm under TCPA algorithm in my machine, that is going to work because I'm going to send the data. So whenever I'm going to send the data, I will apply the algorithm and it is going to work. So that was the nice engineering piece or a kind of mastermind, what I would say by Jacob Sir, who developed that congestion control algorithm for TC. But in, in the innovation of IP layer, we are not that much of lucky. So that way, the IP physics address that was introduced, although it solves many of the problems, but the fundamental architecture was different. As you can imagine, that whenever I am increasing the address space from 32 bit address space to 128 bit address space, obviously my packet header is going to change. And if my packet header is going to change, it is not the sender who is getting impacted, rather the receiver will also get an impact. Uh, so, so that way I will need compatibility with the existing internet and we have never been able to do so. So that way even today we have not been able to in the last 30 years uh, of IPv6 innovation, we have not been able to deploy IPv6 properly over the internet. We are still going on with IPv4 by doing some kind of jugar on top of IPv4. Well, so this NAT is one of those type of jugar. Well, uh, so to solve this problem of IPv6, the remedy that has been accepted widely is to reuse this private IPv4 addresses. So when the IP address space was designed during that time, uh, the designer thought of that it is not always required to connect to your machine to the global internet. Okay. So many of the times it might happen that I will create a small network in a large scale and we will do an experiment with the protocols. Okay? Now for small network, what set of IP addresses we are going to provide them? Right? So for that, basically these private IPv4 addresses were designed and the idea of these private IPv4 addresses was that if you want to create a small subnet which is not connected to the internet, then you use this group of IP addresses there and let that machine talk to each other. Well, so that way from every class of IP addresses, class A, class B, class C, a block of IP addresses have been taken and whenever you are creating a private network, you use that block of IP addresses. Well, so in class A, this 10.0.0.0 slash 8, this block of IP addresses was designated as a private IPv4 address space. Similarly, from class B, it was uh, 172.16.0.0 slash 16 to 171.31. Uh, .0.0 slash 16. So that that um, uh, block of IP addresses, this should not be 171.31, this is 172.31. So this block of IP addresses were designated as the uh, private IPv4 addresses in class B. Similarly, in class C, 192.168.0.0 slash 24 to 192.168.255.0 slash 24, this block of IP addresses was designated as the private IPv4 addresses. Now, the idea of this private IPv4 addresses is that, uh, as I was uh, uh, mentioning, that uh, these private IPv4 addresses are meant for the private network. Well, say the example that I had given, like you develop a small network which does not have any connectivity of the global internet, then for that particular subnet, you can use the private network. Well, now, uh, interestingly, as there is no connectivity with the global internet, this block of IPv4 addresses are reusable. That means you have one subnet here, you have another subnet here. So these two subnets connect to the global internet. They are only it's a set of machines which are talking to each other. So that way, whatever block of IP addresses you are assigning in one group, the same block of IP addresses you can assign to other. Because there is no connectivity among them and they are going to work independently. Well, so you only need unique IP addresses when you want to transfer the packet in the global internet such that in the global internet, everyone, every machine can reach each other. If you are going to use duplicate IP address, there, there is going to be an IP address one. But if you have two subnet, that subnets are set of machines and they are not connected to the global internet and they are not even connected to each other. So I have 10 machines here and 10 machines here and this independently 10 machines are creating a subnet without not being connected to the global internet. Then whatever block of IP addresses you are using here, 
say you are taking 192.168.252.0 that block of IP addresses to the same block of IP addresses you can reuse. Okay. So that way, one of the advantage of private IPv4 addresses is that the addresses are reusable. Okay. Now, uh, whenever you are connecting a machine to a global internet, then that network interface must have a public IPv4 addresses to communicate with the global internet, right? Uh, and the reason for that is to enable the routing of data packets towards the proper destination. So you cannot have an IP address conflict whenever you are talking about the global internet. But at a local scale, you can do that. That luxury you have at a local scale. So the question comes that how can we use this private IP for addresses which are designed to uh, provide IP addresses to the subnets which are working in silos and not connected to the global internet and how we can use that concept of private IPv4 addresses to solve the problem of IPv4 address class. So the idea is something like this, that you create pockets of subnets with reusable private IPv4 addresses. Well, so for example, use the private IPv4 addresses within an organization. So for example, uh, I have the IIT network within IIT Kharagpur network. Let us use a private address block. Say let us use 172.16.0.0 slash 16. Similarly, say in the IIT Delhi network, we use the same block of IP addresses 172.16.0.0 slash 16. Similarly, in the ILSC network, use the same block of IP addresses 172.16.0.0 slash 16. That means within an organization, the set of machines that we have we are just thinking of that every organization is going to work in silos. They are working isolately. That means uh, I, I, am, I am assuming that a machine within IIT Kharagpur network is not going to talk with a machine within the IIC network. So, for example, uh, machines which is in my lab, which is in the lab of our software lab, that is not going to send any data packets to a machine which is in a uh, lab at the CSA department of IIC. Similarly, the machine which is at the in the software lab of the CSC department of the IIT Delhi, that is not going to send a packet to a machine which is in the software lab of uh, our department. Okay, so you can just imagine that doesn't happen, right? So from your machine, you do not uh, from from the machines which are there in our software lab, from there you do not directly connect the machine which is there in the software lab of the CSC department of IIT Delhi. Right? That we never. Do. That way, these networks are actually working in silos. Well, so you can you can just imagine it in that way and think of that well. For this set of machines, I will provide the block of IP addresses from this private IP address. Well, and I can reuse that, reuse the private IP addresses from that block of IP addresses. Now, the interesting observation here is that based on which this entire idea works, is that not all the users in an organization are active simultaneously. You can just think of that in the IIT Kharagpur network, how many users we have. Possibly something in the scale of 10,000 to 50,000. Right? Now, all of the machines are not going to connect it to the internet all the time. Right? You can just imagine the machines which are here in our lab. Right? How many machines are going to get connected at the internet at an instance of time? Well, around 10% of them or 20% of them only at the lab hours, everyone of you are going to send the data, but again, whenever there is a lab hour in the CSC department, the lab hour not, may not be same at the DC or the E department. Right? So that means uh, all these machines are not going to transfer data simultaneously to the internet. Only a subset of them are going to be active at an instance of time. Now, the question comes that, well, Whenever these machines are connected to the internet, means whenever I'm going to connect IIT Kharagpur network to the internet, IIC network to the internet, and IIT Delhi network to the internet, you remember that for internet communication, I need public IP addresses. Well, for the internal communication within the lab, I can work with this private IP address. But whenever I'm going to send the packet from the from a machine in the software lab, say from the Alex building software lab, to the outside internet. So, for example, I'm going to do a Google access or I'm going to watch a video over it. Well, 
So during that time, I need a public IP address, otherwise I cannot send it. And the core idea here is like this, that you map the private IP address of the active users to corresponding public IP address. So that means I have 10,000 uh, machines which are there in the IT Kharagpur network, and out of that, I just observe only thousands of them are active at a time. So the machines which are currently active, we just assign a public IP address to them. Well, and the rest of the machines which are not sending data to the public internet or the global internet, they just work with the private IP addresses. Okay. So uh, here is an example. So for example, um, uh, from an IT Kharagpur network, I have a machine which has a private IP address of 172.16.10.2 and same IP address I can also reuse others. So similarly, I can have another machine which is in the IRC network having the same private IP address of 172.16.10.2 and then whenever we are going to send the data to the internet, they have been provided a public IP address. So whenever this machine of 172.16.10.2 is sending data to the outside internet at that time, I am providing a public IP of 202.141.81.6 to that user. So that is the kind of core idea. That means whenever, by default, you provide the private IP address to a machine, and whenever that machine is going to send data to the internet, during that time, you use a public IP address assigned to the packets or the traffic flows which are originated from that particular machine. So the question comes that how I am going to do this conversion? Right? How I am going to do the conversion from this private IP to the public IP? So this conversion is being done with the help of this network address translation or the NAT. Right? So NAT is basically an internet middle box that translates the private IP addresses to the public IP addresses and vice versa. And this is how NAT works. That same IIT Kharagpur network, I will have a gateway, and in that gateway, I will have a NAT server which is running. Now, I am having a machine which is being assigned a private IP address, say 172.16.10.2, and whenever I am sending a packet, say the packet is destined from the YouTube server, and this packet reaches to the gateway, well, then the, and, and the NAT server is connected to the gateway, and what the NAT server basically does. The NAT server typically maintain a table. So whenever a packet reaches to the NAT server, saying that the source IP is 172.16.10.2, which is a private IP address, and the NAT server sees that well, this packet now needs to go to the outside internet, so it needs a public IP address. So the NAT, NAT server maintains this NAT table where it makes the conversion from the private IP to the public IP. So one of the available public IPs which have been provided to the IIT Kharagpur network. So whenever the IIT Kharagpur network is subscribing uh, the network uh, with the with the CRNA or National Knowledge Network. So you have seen from that case now possibly that IIT Kharagpur network is connected to the Indian Edge network. So whenever the IIT Kharagpur network is subscribing to the Indian Edge network, it can mention that well I need uh, some hundred different public IP addresses. So in, in that case, the NTN administrator will provide that block of IP addresses to the IIT Kharagpur CIC administrator. And the public IP addresses which are used for this NAT conversion are from that block of IP addresses. Well, so whenever the packet reaches to the gateway, the NAT server basically makes this conversion. It provides a public IP of 202.141.81.6. Say for example, with the private IP corresponds to 172.16.10.2, and this mapping is maintained within the NAT table. And now, whenever the packet is going outside the internet, during that time, the source IP, which was earlier as 172.16.10.2, a private IP, that is being replaced as 202.141.8206, which is the corresponding public IP provided by the NAT server. So that means the NAT server makes a modification in the IP header. So what the NAT server does, the NAT server basically changes the IP header. It modifies the public IP, a private IP to a public IP and send it to the outside network. Right? And these modifications are typically done in two different ways. 
uh, one mode is called uh, a kind of uh, uh, tunnel mode. In case of tunnel mode, it actually makes changes in the original IP header. And in another mode, what it does that it adds up a pseudo header on top of the original IP header, and that particular IP header, the additional that IP header that you are adding up, that contains the public IP address at the source IP address. Now, whenever you are providing a public IP address at the source IP address, the packet gets traversed and it reaches to the your destination. And whenever you are getting back a reply, say for example, you have connected to the YouTube server. Whenever you are getting back a reply from the YouTube server, then what the YouTube server will do, that the YouTube server will look into the source IP field of the incoming packet and use that field as the destination ID. Well, so that particular source IP, the public IP which has been assigned, now the destination IP field of this machine will be replaced by that particular IP, which is the 202.141.81.6, and that will be sent up. Well, and this block of IP addresses from the routing uh, policies uh, from based on that BDP routing or all the different routing algorithm that we have learned earlier, it finds out that this block of IP address belongs to the IIT Karakpur network. So the packet is being forwarded to the IP, uh, IIT Karakpur gateway. Now, once the packet comes back to the IIT Karakpur gateway, then again the gateway consults with the map table and finds out that well. This public IP 202.141.81.6 is corresponds to the private IP 172.16.10.2. So whenever the packet is going inside the network, you again change the destination IP as 172.16.10.2 and then apply the corresponding intra-domain routing which is configured for the IIT Karaku network. Say it is RIP, routing information protocol, so you use the RIP to send the packet to the corresponding destination which has the IP address of. What's the material that's in the data? So, this is the typical way um, uh, that, that things work. So in the same way, whenever another machine sends back the packet, the source IP gets modified to the destination IP and the new entry is added to the NAT table. And then, whenever the reply comes back, uh, then, then again it, it, it does the modification and make these changes. Okay. Now, one interesting fact here is that, that well, you can argue that uh, uh, I have multiple different machines which can be active, right? So at the peak hours, although I'm assuming that generally I will have some uh, thousand machines which will be active, that means, uh, say for example, when the software lab is going on at the CSC department, may not be at the same time a lab is going on in the AC department, but it is highly possible that at peak hours, both the labs are operating and you need a more number of IP addresses. Now, to do that, to support this at a larger scale, what we typically do, we take the help of this end to end flow. Now, in a network, in the network protocol stack, we have seen that the communications are from one process to another process, or one application process to another application process, and this application process creates a software. And the individual application processes are identified by IP address and port number. Now, along with every IP address, I can have multiple different port numbers, right? I can have, so the port number is, uh, uh, I, have, I have around uh, uh, 35,000 different port numbers which are possible now. If I just remove the uh, reserved port, still I have multiple number of open ports which are available. So we take a combination of IP address and port numbers to scale up such a system. So that means whenever you are forwarding a packet from inside the network, apart from the IP address, you use the port number and you do the mapping with another IP address and port number. Now here you see this particular example, whenever you are transferring the packet and in this NAT table, I have used two different private IPs, that means the packets are originated from two different flows at two different machines, but they have been assigned the same public IP, but with different port number. Well, so that means this differentiation between the flows are happened between the IP address and the port number combination, and in this particular example, what particularly we are going to do is that 
rather than uniquely identifying every independent nation in a network, the NAC is maintaining or making a mapping for every independent flow of the network. Well, now from a single machine, even if it is getting connected to the internet, obviously it will not have that uh, 65,000 uh, number of different uh, flows, right? It will have maximum 100 different flows or 200 different flows, even if we think of at a larger scale. Well, so that many number of flows are there and that many number of, for that many number of flows, if I do a corresponding mapping at the public IP space, I will have more number of port numbers which will be available. And I can use that port number to assign the flows or address port combination to the flows which belong to a different mission. Okay. So that way, by doing this address port combination in a typical NAC, we extend the scalability of the system along. Well, so that is the typical idea of NAC which are being used here. And almost for all the kind of organizational network nowadays, People use private IP address within the network and they use this concept of uh, uh, IP port combination and the NAC at their gateway to make a mapping from the private IP address to the public IP address. Well, so this is common for almost all the organizations in the in the world. Well, so they operate in this particular way. Now, this way the NAC provides a kind of Juba a kind of takeaway solution for handling the IP address scarcity problem. You see that by utilizing these private IP addresses along with this combination with the port number, we can get a large number of combinations and for that large number of combination, we can work um, uh, independently. But the problems which are associated with the NAT are as follows. I guess whenever you have, you are in, uh, within IIT Kharagpur, you have faced similar type of problems or you have observed similar type of problems that many of the internet protocols and services such as H0 to 323, RCL, IRC, PPTP, ICMP, etc. they do not work over such internet media boxes. Okay? Particularly when the outside machines need to initiate a connection. So for example, I think you have seen that if you do a ping or trace route from a machine within IIT Kharagpur Haraku network, which has a private IP address and you want to do a mean to say Google to some machine which is outside IP uh, IP Kharagpur network, that mean doesn't work. Mean on press route that doesn't work. Well, so that is one of the problem with NAN that uh, it doesn't support ICMP directly. And the problem is again particular when the outside internet needs to create a connection. So for example, you have seen that if you just simply run a web server in your machine. Although from within IIT Kharagpur network, you are able to access it, but from outside IIT Kharagpur network, you will not be able to access it. Why? Because whenever we are doing this kind of mapping, the mapping happens whenever the machine inside the network initiates the connection and the first packet reaches to the map. Well, at that time, it does the mapping. But if the outside machine just sends a packet, during that time, this kind of mapping is not there. So you will not be able to forward the packet any further. Well, so this is the kind of challenges that we have uh, whenever we are going to use uh, this uh, kind of uh, NAT. Now, sometimes NAT is combined with DNS to provide such kind of support that well, the DNS will do our name resolution and find out that what is the corresponding mapping. Uh, DNS provides the IP address of the NAT server, uh, which helps in address translation. But that particular solution has a lot of overhead, and that's why in practice we seldom use that. Well, and another challenge with the NAT is that the processing of the NAT table is to be very fast. Well, uh, many of the times this NAT becomes a kind of performance bottleneck in the internet because you can see that all the packets from IIT Kharagpur, which is going outside at the NAT, you need to do an address translation for that. Well, so that way, the NAT server needs to work uh, in a speed of a typical router, high speed router. And that way, if your NAT server becomes slow, your over overall internet performance within that organization is going to get up. So these are the kind of challenges of the overhead which are associated with NAT. But because NAT provides an interesting solution uh, 
for handling the IP address scarcity problem, and it is really a problem nowadays. I Means we, we cannot use public IP addresses in all the machines that we have. We already have more number of machines connected to the internet than the number of public IP addresses that we have. So we have to use some kind of remedy, and NAS provide a NAT provides a kind of nice remedy for that. Okay. So this is uh, all about our uh, discussion of NAT. Uh, now, in the context of NAT, I would just like to mention uh, one particular tool called uh, IP mask editing. So this IP mask editing is a process where uh, one computer acts as an IP gateway for, for a network, and all other computers forward IP packets to that gateway. Then the gateway replaces the source IP address with another IP address, typically its own IP address, and forward the packet to the outside network. So this IP mask order that is mostly used to hide the IP address of an internal computer of a network. Well, so that means you send uh, the packets to a kind of common gateway, and the gateway replaces the source IP with its own IP. That way, to the outside internet, outside of that gateway, it is something like that. The uh, gateway is sending the packet, so you are hiding the machines which are behind uh, that particular gateway. Now, NAT typically works like the IP mask error, and the idea of NAT actually evolved from the idea of IP mask error. So, I would suggest or encourage all of you to check this IP mask Linux tool uh, to set up IP mask editing over Linux. Okay, so you can. Do IP mask editing is using IP mask tool, and you can actually change the IP addresses which are being forwarded uh, from your machine. So that is all about our discussion about uh, uh, NAT. Uh, let me know if you have any questions or query, any doubt, any comment up to this point. Sir, uh, even the uh, currently active internet users will be growing largely, right? Yes, yes. So anyway, we'll run out of IPv4 addresses. Yeah, so that's why so what people are envisioning that, well, if you make a combination of IP address and the port, so the last idea that I have just mentioned, that uh, for every private IP, we are not going to assign to a public IP. Rather, we are going to make a combination of the IP address and the port number. That way, you have 65,000 port number possible. Now, for every public IP, you can actually support 65,000 different private IP addresses. So, at least 65,000 different flows, which are being uh, originated from uh, uh, the, the machines inside the network. Now, by doing this combination of the IP address and the port number, uh, till now we are able to solve this problem. So, till now we are able to uh, uh, do, do kind of do away with the problem of IP people. Right? But again, you are right that if you are going to the domain of IP network where in a single smart home, I can have 1000 different IP devices or the sensing devices which are connected to the internet and going to send data. Even this IP address port combination is not going to work. Right? Uh, so for that purpose, what typically people use is uh, that kind of scenarios actually happen for uh, environment like the smart manufacturing. See, in a company where, or in a manufacturing or in a process automation lab, uh, where you have such millions of sensors which are monitoring uh, the farm, here actually how you are going to do this. Kind of things. Where what people does, they make a kind of similar concept of NAT, but rather than mapping from an IP before private IP to IP before public IP, it makes a mapping from IP V6 address to IP before public IP. Okay. So that means the internal network you maintain with the IP V6 network. Well, but whenever you are sending the packet outside, then you make a mapping to a corresponding IPv4 network with a port number. Well, so that is a kind of NAT which conferred from an IPv6 port number combination to an IPv4 port number combination. So that way uh, it basically works or it tries to work. But 
Oh, if it will convert again back to IP before, then number of public IPs or IP port combination will remain same. Yeah, it's it's getting reduced, but yeah, the main assumption is that you are not going to run all the machines simultaneously. If you are going to run that, you don't have any solution which are available with IP. Yes, sir. But I mean, what was the point of that IPv6 using and then mapping it to IPv4 again? No, it is something like that. Whenever you have large number of machines which are even beyond the scope of IPv4 public address code. So the IPv4 public addresses you see that sorry, IPv4 private addresses they are also limited. Like so, we have that 10 dot series from class A, 172 dot series from class B, and 192 dot 168 series from class. So even if you have more number of devices than that for that kind of combinations. Okay, so one more thing said. Uh, you said that deploying IPv6 is hard because uh, each destination uh, PC may not have the same thing. Right, the destination might not use IPv6. Yeah, the destination may not use it. So instead of that, if each in, uh, NAT will use it, then Will it not be sufficient to convert each internal IPv4 to public IPv6? And again, at the oh, well, destination one, NAT. Right, right. One, one important point is that it is not only about the destination, but about all the routers that are there in the, in, in the intermediate network. Right? Because the routers need to forward it based on this uh, IP table data. Right? Now, the intermediate routers, if they do not support IPv6, then you will not be able to forward the IPv6. So typically people try to work with different kind of remedies. So nowadays, if you look into the machines that we are having, all those machines support dual protocol stack. That means you have an IP before stack and at the same time you have IPv6 stack. Well, so uh, you provide an IP before address and there is a kind of standard conversion mechanisms which are being applied. Using that, you make a uh, conversion to IPv6. Well, now, whenever the packet is going to the outside network, uh, if it supports IPv6 routing, it uses IPv6 routing, otherwise it uses IPv4 routing. But for that kind of things, you need to do a lot of conversion. So a lot of back calculation and maintaining consistency across the networks become a challenge because you need to ensure that the behavior of the IPv4 routing for a particular router would be similar to the behavior of the IPv6 routing. Okay. And that way, uh, you cannot just randomly assign some of the IPv6 address uh, to the machines. Right? So in that way, people are gradually trying to, so what people have been to uh, assume that, well, if I start uh, applying dual protocol stack, then um, um, I, I will be able to move, gradually able to move to the IPv6. And that way, some countries internally have started using IPv6, for example, Japan. <coughs> Or, uh, um, or South Korea, so uh, they internally started using IPv6. So it was something like that whenever a packet is routed to some machine in Japan, so the gateway uh, which, uh, to which you are entering towards the network of Japan, uh, that makes the conversion from IPv4 to IPv6. And within Japan, they are using IPv6. Well, so so all, the, all the routers within Japan are have been replaced with IPv6. So, so that way some countries or indeed some small countries where you have uh, possibilities for doing such kind of replacement, you can take initiative by the government to replace all the uh, intermediate routers or even if all the network service providers which are there in a specific country, they come to an agreement that well, we are going to replace all the machines, all the routers with IPv6 supported routers. Then it can be, but globally we are not been able to do so. Particularly because uh, although many of the developed countries or the first world countries already have IPv6 supported routers, they have been able to replace the routers. But for countries like even India, even India is a much uh, better scale because uh, the telecom industry in India is one of the kind of uh, richest uh, telecom industry in the world. Uh, so that way I know that if many of the network service providers in India, they have IPv6 supported routers. But say the African countries, they are not being able to do so. Uh, so that way even today the global internet has not uh, have 
support for completely moving to IPv6. So, Pankaj, does it clarify your doubt or yes, anything? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. So, any other doubt? Sir, uh, suppose yeah. uh, in the destination machine, we have the, some kind of IP based rate limiting. Then, if someone within a network that is uh, access to a NAT, uh, 100 people try to uh, access that site, then that uh, rate limit will be imposed on the public IP itself, right? So then everyone will be penalized. Uh, can you repeat once? So uh, is it clear now, sir? Uh, so uh, I am saying that in if a if a destination suppose uh, there, there is some site which uh, a, a, say in IIT Kharagpur we are uh, inside a net. So let's say 100 people try, are trying to access a site. Uh, which has a IP based rate limiting of say uh, one uh, one request per second. So say every every one of the user is doing one request per second, but since hundred of the users are uh, sharing that connection, sharing the same public IP, won't the rate limit be imposed on the public IP itself? So how do I uh, control this so situation? So first of all, typically for the web servers, we do not keep it behind the net. So for example, IIT Kharagpur web server and IIT Kharagpur mail server, it is outside net and it is always given a public IP address. That is particularly because the outside the internet is accessing that. And uh, uh, another, so, so this problem of rate limiting will come here because you see that if the NAT is, as I was mentioning, that if the NAT is getting overloaded, then the NAT will become the performance bottleneck. So if you want to make people access to that website higher NAT, then again the NAT is going to get uh, a kind of performance for the NAT because as you have mentioned that 100 people are going to access the website higher than NAT. Okay. So that is one of the reasons and the second reason is that we do not for such kind of public servers of an organization where we know that uh, people from the globe or people outside is always going to access that. We do not use uh, NAT here. We keep those servers uh, in front of NAT. And one public IP address is always given there. Uh, from the rate limiting part of, uh, perspective, if you are doing a rate limiting on a particular IP address, and if uh, uh, that IP address is one of the NAT IP address, that means a public IP address which is used in the NAT, then obviously all the users are going to uh, get suffer because if you provide some one request per second uh, for a particular uh, public IP address which is assigned to a NAT, uh, then you cannot send more requests uh, than that. So if there are 100 machines which are connected via NAT and uh, they use that pu particular public IP address, they are going to suffer. But that kind of configurations are not very common in internet. So as I have mentioned that this rate limiting, all these things are typically being done for web servers and they are typically put uh, uh, behind the NAT. They are, they are not, sorry, they are typically put in front of NAT. They are not put behind NAT. Okay, sir. Okay. Anything else? Any other doubt or query? Yes, sir. Mm, yes, sir. Uh, I wanted to ask, like, uh, what is port forwarding and how is it different from uh, NAT IP masking? Port forwarding is a kind of similar concept, but the uh, idea of port forwarding is something like that. Uh, oh, oh. So, let me do one thing. So, I, I'm taking up this question, okay, because uh, I can, I can try to draw, not sure, I might have a pen and paper, so, so if, I, if I had access to a blackboard, that might have been. So I will try to prepare a slide on that and share it in the next class. So it brought, uh, what code forwarding basically does, code forwarding typically means, say, say for example, you have two different machines. For one particular machine, you have, well, and for another 
definition you do not have that kind of explanation. Right? So one example I am giving here, giving it to you. So for example, uh, that uh, say say in, in, so I, I typically run a lab, a research lab uh, within our department that is called a system research lab. So in system research lab, I have one public IP address. Well, so that is actually being assigned by the CNC. Now that public IP address is assigned to one particular machine. Now what happens that uh, um, say so for example I I design a server and I run a web server which is behind that. Yeah, that machine the web server is actually done. One thing is that what I am going to do is I want the outsiders should be able to connect to this particular um, uh, particular web server. So how will I do that? Now to do that, what I typically typically do that this web server is running on a particular port, say it is running in any way your port on a uh, on a particular IP address, and I have another public IP address. Say that public IP address is 202.141.8.1.2. Well, and the uh, web server is actually running in a machine, uh, say which has an IP address of 10.1.1.1. Well, now what I do that I take the domain name. Well, and after taking that domain name, what I do that I assign that domain name with the IP address. 202.141.8.1.2, which is the public IP address that I have, and the fixed port. Typically, in the NAT, what happens that we dynamically assign the IP address port combination, but here I do not take the dynamic port, rather, I define a fixed port that I define the port as set 3122. So that DNS resolution, when it will happen, it will say that when the web server is running at a machine 202.141.8.2.2 at the port 312. Well, and I put a port forwarding room in that particular machine 202.141.8.2.2 saying that if any request comes to the port 312, then you forward that request to the machine 10.1.1.1 at port 822. Okay, so this is basically called a port forwarding. So the difference of Port forwarding from NAT is that in case of NAT, these port addresses which are being provided along with the public IP address, it is decided dynamically, it is decided by the NAT server. Okay, so the NAT server, whenever a connection is being initiated, the NAT server finds out what is an open public IP with the port combination and it assigns them. But in case of port forwarding, I am Fixing up the port there and saying that the 3122 port, if any packet is coming for that port address 3122, then you always forward it to the IP address 10.1.1.1 at port 8020. Okay, so that way actually we are solving that particular problem. So I think I mentioned here that this problem that initiating the connection from outside network will take the help of DNS. So we take the help of DNS with, uh, with this kind of port forwarding mechanism. So the DNS says that, well, uh, if your uh, domain name is, say, shondipc.iatkatp.ac.in, uh, then you send the packet to the machine 202.141.91.81.2 uh, at the port 3122. And once the packet comes to that particular port 3122 at the machine 202.141.81.2, I put a port forwarding rule there that any packets coming to that 3122 port will forward it to this uh, private machine with IP 10.1.1.1 that the uh, server is running at port 80. So this is basically called a port forwarding. So am I been able to explain it? And the application is something like this that you want to run a web server uh, in a, in a uh, private machine and want the outsiders people to connect to that particular machine for forwarding. Uh, that data. Sir, is it clear to you, Miss? Okay, sir. And sir, is it safe to like uh, do this port? Yes, sir. Yes. yes. But uh, sir, uh, is it safe to open uh, do this port forwarding? Uh, 
Yes, because yes, it yes. exposes our ex a machine to the global internet. Right, right. So, so it, it actually helps uh, that a machine which are behind the net, but uh, typically if a machine is behind the net, the connections need to be initiated by, by that particular machine. So here port forwarding is helping you to access a machine behind the net through a fixed port of one particular IP address. Okay, so, so the difference from the NAT is that in case of NAT, the public IP and the port is assigned dynamically, but in case of this uh, uh, port forwarding, the public IP and the port that need to be fixed. Okay. If it is dynamic, how people will get to know? So you remember that. If you want to connect to www.google.com or www.itkdp.ac.in, the itkdp.ac.in should run in a fixed IP address. If it keeps on changing uh, at every 15 minutes, you cannot run. Well, because you need to put up that mapping in the address. Well, so, so that way you need a fixed IP and a fixed port. So in case of port forwarding, port forwarding, you can just imagine it as, it as, it's a kind of sub function of NAT where NAT assigns the public IP and the port dynamically, but in case of port forwarding, we are just doing the reverse thing that we are using a fixed public IP and the port, but using the fixed public IP and the port, which is being mapped to the DNS to connect to a machine, which is at a private network. Okay. Any other doubt? Okay, so let us take a break for five minutes. So it is 9.05 in my clock. So we'll be back at 9.10. And then we'll start with, um, yeah.